how did cells form? Uh, reproduction, we mentioned that, and so on. Organic proof reading and editing system. Uh, a marvelous system you have in the cell, because when DNA is read, it's read at the rate, uh, produced at the rate of about, you know, three, three to five bases of your code per second. Errors do occur, and enough errors occur that it's incompatible. You have a system there in the cell to proofread and see, hey, is there an error? And if there's an error, there's another system to remove the error and replace it with the correct thing. It's, it's editing and proofreading type of thing that makes life possible. How did life ever arise before you had that system? It is, you know, it's an unsolved problem in molecular biology if you don't want to think about a designer God and the thing. So, anyway, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, part of the issue you face when you know so much more than the first uh, than you and Semmelweis and uh, Darwin's time, per se. And all this without laboratories or chemists has to happen by itself. Well, uh, <coughs> complex events, organisms, uh, very interesting things. Then uh, you get into what some of the irreducible complexity problem that Michael Behe talks about, but we're talking here about it at the uh, organic uh, system of living things uh, level, not the organic molecule <coughs> system that Behe talks about. Uh, but these complex systems, they don't have survival, survival value until all the necessary engineering parts are present. Uh, just one example here, a uh, picture of an eye, a human eye here, the lens is right here, the light comes in this way, <coughs> type of thing. Uh, supposing you're evolving a system to focus. Well, sometime in this process of evolution, you're going to have to provide a system that focuses uh, the eye. And in the case of man, we have certain muscles right here that change the shape of the lens. <coughs> well, so you evolve the muscle. What good is the muscle? If it doesn't have fibers to attach to the lens, if it doesn't have a nerve to make it work, if it doesn't have a control system to indicate how much focusing you're going to do, if it doesn't have a system in the brain to tell you, hey, the eye is out of focus. Without all those parts, the system is useless. There is no survival value, folks. The very system that Darwin proposed, a survival of the fittest, interferes with the evolution of complex systems. And yet, survival of the fittest is claimed, hey, Darwin permitted atheists to be intellectually satisfied. I mean, this is the answer. He provided the answer to, to the, the argument from design. No, look at it carefully. You know what happens to structures that are useless? They, de they degenerate. You ever heard of these blind cave fish? They live in caves where there's no light in Mexico. And their eyes degenerate. Mutations come along. There's no reason to, for, the, for the eyes to, to be there and so on. So they survive just as well. If you have complex systems like the muscle for an eye, Mutations are going to take care of that. And pretty soon, you know, it'll degenerate type of thing. Until all the parts are there, so you have some survival value. Survival of the fittest is going to get rid of developing complex systems. Let's move on. <coughs> oh, long GR days, way too short for the improbabilities of evolution. Well, ah, uh, <coughs> this is, uh, uh, an idea has been proposed, like George Wall, I remember him giving a lecture once, uh, when he's passed away now, he's a Nobel laureate, no, no, no. <laughs> but he, he has written, he give him so much time, the impossible becomes possible, possible, probable, and the probable virtually certain, one only has, only has to wait 
Time itself performs the miracles. Just wait long enough. He's talking about two billion years for, for the ordinary life. Uh, in the context uh, of what he's saying here and so on. You start doing your calculations. Totally, these billions of years are totally inadequate. Now, I believe in the recent creation by God 2,000 years ago. But, in order to help these students out and others, come on. give them their billions of years. It's not going to help hardly at all. Why do I say that? Well, uh, let me give you a couple of examples here. We're going to make a protein molecule. Protein molecule of 100 amino acids, specifically each one of these has to be the right amino acid. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids. Uh, it's a little bit like a word, 100, uh, 100 letters. And you have to have the right letters in the right place. <laughs> so, uh, French biophysicist, uh, he said, hey, let's have all atoms, as many atoms as we have in the earth, shake them 500 trillion times per second. He estimated it would take 10 to the 242nd power billion years to produce one specific protein molecule. So, I thought that you got one protein molecule. I mean, remember how many protein molecules we had in Escherichia coli, you know? About four million. Uh, another example. Hillary Yuki, University of California. Uh, he started out with amino acids all made. And he kind of made things easier there. And But he had these all over this, the oceans of the earth. That was his soup type of thing. And he, uh, he was suggesting that uh, uh, if, if you shook these change the combination of these amino acids and so on in that big world ocean type of thing. Uh, on an average, it would take 10, 10 to the 23, 23rd power years to produce one amino acid. You see why well, you can say, hey, uh, these billions of years, they don't help. I mean, this figure here is... Uh, assuming the Earth is five billion years, being a little bit generous uh, to evolution, uh, ten thousand billion times too short to produce one protein molecule. See the problem? Unfortunately, this is not uh, taken up in the discussions. Uh, well, we, like the origin of species or uh, even modern things. No, uh, there's that big, hey, we, we, we can make amino acids maybe in the laboratory, but uh, beyond that, they don't do the calculations. Well, we got to move on here. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I should just just remember here where I'm in this thing. Right, coming to Michael Behe. Uh, Michael Behe has written this book, The Edge of Evolution, and so on. And he makes one very important point there. And that is that, uh, you know, we talk about viruses mutating. You heard uh, H1N1 maybe is mutating now again, uh, type of thing, possibly the last two or three days, and so on. Uh, influenza virus changes. The uh, AIDS virus, you know, mutates all the time. It's and so on. And, and, and we, hey, things are changing, mutating. Oh, good. For evolution, we can get new, new organisms here pretty fast. 